Meet the Farmer TV is made possible by the generous support of Planet Earth Diversified, Makia Video Productions, and Frank Melly Productions, with additional support from Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture. Hello, welcome to Meet the Farmer TV. I'm Michael Clark, a local farmer, engineer, and proponent of alternative agriculture. During this economic crisis, we will explore how you can benefit as well as support local community food systems. And so these are what we sell as the field greens um, that are, you know, much lower price, right. but they're tougher and grittier right. and we have to wash them. You see the larger tot soy, you're used right. to the micro tot soy, there's some of the big stuff. So this is one of the systems that we do to, to get multiple cropping out. And then this is a continuous production also. You can see the rows are in, in different stages. Uh, and we have, uh, there is a special machine we built uh, on that tractor over there for making these beds. Oh, okay. This uh, on the right is actually the flower house where we grow your roses. Oh, okay. We'll go in there in a minute and look at those. So these were all uh, hot peppers and pumpkins this summer and now we've uh, removed our weed fabric and our, our uh, drip irrigation and we've retilled them and planted spinach and we can see there are various stages of that spinach so we'll have okay. continuous spinach for you through the winter time and into the uh, spring. So it does grow the, then in Virginia all year round? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we can see here sort of a middle crop, nice little tiny and, and sometimes we'll take these just as baby spinach where okay. we'll pull the whole thing up. But these are beets so in your micro root mix, you get the, the baby beet greens. Correct. And here's a, the bigger version. Okay. And these are grown mainly for, instead of the bulbous part of the root, these are grown for uh, larger beet leaves. Okay. Like this, where we would pick, you can see it's, if you want a baby beet, we've got that. Okay. Uh, but we've also got uh, baby beet leaves. So we would go out and individually cut those uh, to get those nice leaves. And we have the same thing here uh, with the kale, where we grow a red kale. Okay, I remember getting some of that last year. Yeah, so this is the, the and so we have to come out with scissors and select and cut these okay. perfect little leaves. Uh, and you can see there's, you know, we've been doing that some, and then we cut the big ones off so that we get more of the, the young ones growing. So everything is hand cut then here? Nothing's yes, there, there's no machine harvesting in what we're doing here. Okay. And right. it's all done specifically based on your, your requirements and specifications of that okay. size and what you want. That's why they're not a dollar a pound in a big case. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so we'll see here, this is some spinach uh, that we are harvesting right at this time. Uh, you can see he's cutting some of that, the baby spinach now. Okay. And we've been cutting it pretty hard for Thanksgiving, so there's not a whole lot left, but there is some. Let's go take a look. What are those larger plants? The big yellow things are, uh, it's a kinko pak choy. Oh, okay. Uh, and they're so yellow that everybody thinks they're bad, but right. they actually grow that size and color. Uh, but we don't sell very many of them because they look like they're, they're uh, yellow and gone bad, right, but well, that's yeah. their natural color. Oh, okay. Now you can see a mustard green here that's a, a brighter color. And so you can see this is a nice little mustard green. Oh, okay. You can taste that. It's got a good bit of spice and fire to it. Mm. These are little bacon. Yeah. <laughs> and then these are the, what, what he's cutting right now, okay, these baby, the spinach, baby leaves. spinach leaves. So you can see we have to actually go through and find the leaves that we want, allow the other ones to grow. Uh, and then if it's not so rainy, we'll actually be weeding these by oh, okay. hand. Uh, we, you know, we can use some tillage in between, but it's all by hand through the middles of those rows. Okay. So how long does it take to get that large? Well, this is probably from uh, the end of July, beginning of August. These rows were planted right at the sort of the, the end of one of the melon seasons. So we tilled in those melons and recycled the, the plant waste and put in these uh, fall greens. Oh, okay. So it does take some planning, you know, many months ahead to, to put in the, the, the right sequence of things. Right. So actually in the beginning of the year, we're looking at each of these beds and rows saying, all right, we're gonna grow melons and they'll be finished at this time and then we'll move in the spinach. The peppers will go on till frost, so they'll get the later spinach. Right. 
so that there's a whole sequence of things. It's almost like you move in customers through a restaurant when you've okay. got more customers and seats, how right. you set your reservations up. Okay. So we're doing the same thing in the farm. And, and if a big party cancels, your, like, your whole scheme gets messed up. Correct. So we have the same situation here. So then do you grow in each individual row multiple things at one time? Or we can. Uh, these are just sort of volunteers that came in that were okay. intended to be be spinach and some of the, the seed from the other crop uh, okay. remained. Uh, and that's part of the, the natural growing system without herbicides. We don't totally sterilize the soil each time. Right. So you'll get uh, self-seeded residues okay. from the crops okay. previously. Okay, so these are the things we're growing outside and we grow them year round. We also grow some more tender things inside. So uh, we'll cut some spinach uh, to take into the restaurant later. could talk a little bit about now is if we look at this plate here uh, with the, the edible flowers and the, these little roses it would be pretty hard to make a phone call and e even call California and have miniature roses edible roses right. sent to you and have them be worth anything and we certainly couldn't grow them for you now in December if we didn't have that commitment that you're buying them every week all the way right. through the year so we can spend the tens of thousands of dollars it takes to, to put up that special greenhouse and dedicate that square footage and then make sure we pick each of those roses at a prime time because we know you're going to get them in a, in a, at a certain time each week. Right. If you just called up this morning and said, oh, give me the roses, and we hadn't been watching and collecting them all that time, we wouldn't have what you wanted. Right. So that's part of that arrangement that we have of a commitment throughout the whole year and in that way we actually hold the same price. Right. So when we have 10 times as many roses in July as we have in December and January, we're still charging the same price. Same price. So you're able to do your food costs. Do your accountants ever get a clue on that, that this commitment actually <laughs> is meaning that you're, you're not getting a spot. I mean, here we are in a world that oil is $49 today, and it was $149 a barrel three months three ago. Months ago. And so the, the, the consumer doesn't trust prices anymore. Right. They think it's all fake. Right. But you and I are really working hard to keep these long-term arrangements, and, and having the same price on, a, on some produce year-round is a pretty odd thing. Right. And I mean, and that's where you brought up earlier, you know, that's the benefits of having a partnership and being local that you and I can sit down and you and I may argue on some things, but normally we both come out on top where I'm getting what I need and you're getting what you need, where if I was trying to buy this from California and I'm on the phone arguing with somebody, they could be holding the phone out here going, I'm not listening to you anymore <laughs> and have no clue right. of what I'm saying. And by that, I get angry, I stop using them, and all of a sudden on our dishes, you start seeing things, you know, beautiful flowers disappearing. You know, a lot of people, still today, a lot of people don't understand that you can eat these roses or eat the violets, or to them a garnish is a garnish. It's, it would be like taking a piece of plastic on top of your food and they're picking it up and set it to the side. But as time has been going on, and we educate our staff to let them know that you can eat it, and we're actually putting other things than just taking a rose and popping it in your mouth and eating it, because that is foreign to a lot of people. We're starting to see more and more and more people actually taking advantage of what we're putting on it by saying, hey, that is local. You want to support the local movement? They'll just pay for it, actually try it and eat it. And people are actually starting to do it now. But one of the things that, that's happened to us as growers many times is we all have a, a grocer or a chef will say, please grow me this. I, I want yellow heirloom tomatoes. I can buy hundreds of pounds of heirloom yellow tomatoes. Do that for me next year, and we do it, and you know, and we spend months getting that ready. Right. And we show up when we've got all these beautiful tomatoes, and there are three of our buddies, the same day, walk into the same door with the same tomato. Right. And that's been a real common approach that, that kind of comes from that accounting side. Uh, get the suppliers fighting over your business. And then when the three of them are standing there and you can only buy from one, the guy that's willing to go lowest gets the sale, you get the best right. price. But for me, what I've seen is then all three farmers refuse to grow those right. things ever again. And that's really where, you know, 
it sounds redundant, but it's it, it's a relationship that we build. You know, if if you tell me you can give me something and you say this is the price, then I factor that into my dish. And in theory, I shouldn't look anywhere past that. Uh, you know, it, it is it is tempting sometimes when people come in and it's the same product, but then it, it really comes down to cutting it open, putting a little salt and pepper on it, and popping it in your mouth and comparing it. And I've, I've done it with you know beef cutting, seafood cuttings, all those things where I bring in those three guys and sit them down and say, listen, I believe all you guys have the best product and you might be the cheapest and you might be the most expensive, but let's see what tastes the best. And if we sit down and we cut into those, you know, technically the same heirloom tomato and we put a little salt and pepper on it and we all at the same time eat it and you go, hmm, that's good. Or one has no flavor to it. And then the other one has just a little bit of flavor and you're the guy that's got the most flavorful tomato and you're the most expensive tomato. To me, it's better to buy the most expensive tomato because it carries the most flavor. I, I feel like that's where a lot of restaurants and chefs kind of go to downfall because they'll look at a price on something and say $15 a pound versus $7 a pound. But when you actually taste the $7 a pound item, and you're like, well, there's really not a whole lot of flavor to that. And you taste the $15 a pound item and you're blown away because it tastes like it came right out of your backyard and you grew it yourself, then it should be justified that you're paying $15 a pound because what you're actually giving people, and if it's $30 on a plate that you're eating, you want them to eat the best thing possible that you can get into your own hands. So, well, that's interesting. So really what you're saying is, is the price is the only thing that's really quantified about the food. Right. And it really depends on someone like yourself, a chef, to quantify that other part of what what is the standard of the flavor. I mean, right. if you buy vitamins, you get some milligrams or you right. get some test result from a lab that's supposed to tell you which pill has more of the active right. ingredient. But with the flavor in the food, it really is is up to your artistic decision and you don't ever give a number to the accountants that they can put in that spreadsheet to factor that this one dollar thing only has a tenth the flavor, so the two dollar actually is half the cost. Right. And, I, and, I, and to me, I've always had the mind frame, you know, and it's really only been the, the past couple of years since I've really broadened my knowledge and taste buds on things. But a lot of people go by recipes. You could go by recipes on pastries and desserts and those type of things because it is more of a science where you have to have the right proportions on things. And I've been a chef that, you know, people constantly harp on consistency, consistency, consistency. And you can be consistently bad as a company or a restaurant and you'll still have a ton of people come and eat your food, but that's what they expect. So when it stays that way, it stays that way. When you buy more of the mass produced items, you lose a lot of lack in flavor, you know, like the tomatoes are not as robust flavor, not as juicy, they're really mealy and just kind of watery things you put in your mouth. It's just something to put on the plate. Right, and so, you know, I've had it time and time again where it's hard to be consistent when you're, when you have a set menu, everything is organic, everything, you can pick two tomatoes at the same time off the same plant, and they're not gonna taste identically the same. And with that being said, when you're doing that, you can't really create a recipe off of five pounds of this, you know, a couple of teaspoons of this, you know, a pat of butter here, a pat of butter there, because everything in life tastes completely different. Just because you pick one apple off the tree doesn't mean that one on the other side is gonna take, taste identical to that. And I feel like people kind of forget that whole mentality of it's things that are, are grown from the earth that everything does taste different, that you can't get exactly the same taste off of things. So when that is said, you have to be able to look at the locally type things where they're picked right, right off of the vine versus buying something from California that is, is cheaper, but it's being picked when it's so green. They stick it in a warehouse, they let it ripe, then they put it on a truck. It takes anywhere from four to five days to get over to the East Coast or vice versa. You know, things that are indigenous to the East Coast that go over to the West Coast and you're not getting the quality or the flavor of what you're really buying. What we're really saying here is the only thing that you can consistently get is low quality. So you can either lower your quality standards to where you know you can always get it. You can get something red disc 
right. that you can call a tomato on a burger. And as long as you don't worry about what it tastes like, you can get it at all kinds of low prices and you can get it any time of the year. But if you're going for that highest quality level, it's very similar to the problem we have. We grow these beautiful microgreens and we show them to you, you go, yeah, I want that every week. And then we're like, oh man, that was the best we've ever done. Now we got to do it all the time. So we kind of share that, that search for excellence. And in this partnership where you agreed to continue to support my efforts and I agree to continue to support your efforts for that, that excellent product, uh, we're both sort of artisans in that right. way. Right. You know, it, it's, it's, you know if, if you're eating a burger and you're eating a frozen patty and then you, your buddy sit next to you and he just hand ground his own beef that he pulled out of his backyard and he's got, you know, heads of cabbage because I, for some reason, he liked cabbage on my burgers. Yeah. But, you know, lettuce, cabbage, whatnot, onions, all those type things. And you're sitting there eating a generic burger that anybody in the United States can eat because it comes out of one warehouse. I'm jealous of the guy sitting next to me eating the homegrown, hand ground type stuff. And I want to eat that. But so that's really what you're trying to provide your right, customers. Right. Something they can only get from you, the chef artist. Right. And you need the same high level ingredients and you can really only obtain those from a local source that will continue to work with right, you through right. the process. Because you can, you know, like I said earlier, you, you, I can't I can't form a relationship with somebody especially vegetable wise, fruit wise, any of those type things on the on the west coast where it grows prominently year round because of the climate and all those type things. You know, I, I could do it with a fish purveyor on the West Coast, of calling them up and saying, listen, I'm not paying you because you didn't send me the right things. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't call them and say, when exactly that orange is ripe in California, I want you to pick it and send it to me because by the time it gets to me, it's already turned and spoiled, rotten, you know, it's, it's getting mealy, those type things, and it's losing the, the vibrance flavor that you get if you live in California and you actually pick it from your tree and you peel it right there and you eat it. So the only places I know on the East Coast in Charlottesville that is a lot colder than I wish it was yeah. is, you know, certain purveyors, you guys being, you know, primarily the main one because a lot of the other people can't keep up with the consistency of the fresh products and they lack the ability to create the relationships that we do. Well, that's great, Jeff. This has been really good talking about these things and help me understand more of where your your artistic search for excellence comes from and how we can support that. We'll talk some more in the uh, about what we're going to grow for you next year, but let me get out of your way and and let you do your work and and create some beautiful dishes for us. That sounds Thank great. you. Amanda, tell us about the different things that you use, uh, drinks and simple syrups and uh, there's a Thai basil syrup, a, a rosemary syrup, and, and there's something called liquid love. Tell us all yes. about that. Okay. okay, so in this cocktail, we uh, use a rosemary simple syrup and we get our rosemary from a uh, local grower, a local provider. So in this cocktail, we have an edible rose uh, provided by local growers that we top this cocktail with. And in this cocktail, we uh, get our Thai basil from a local provider, in which we make a Thai basil simple syrup to go in the cocktail. Are there other products that you use here, uh, beers or wines or something like that, that come from the local area? Yes, we, uh, we definitely support our local uh, wineries and in the greater Charlottesville area. Um, we also carry several beers that are uh, brewed out in Crozet, so that's uh, not too far from Charlottesville. We carry their whole line. So as you can see, as we've been working with Jeff at Blue Light Grill, there are a number of interactions that we have to go through to make the product grow at the rate that he wants, to get the, the products that he does want, to make sure our transitions as his menu changes work. Here we 
are in the Charlottesville Holiday Market mid-December. There's light snowfall. We've got craft vendors. We've got food vendors. Uh, we've even had a seafood vendor with fresh local seafood. So let's talk to Stephanie Malloy, the city market manager, and find out more about this holiday market and how the city market went this year. How has the, the city market been performing in the, the recent year compared to the last years? And, and how many years has the market been going on? The city market um, started in 1973, and um, it's, it's been increasing by leaps and bounds, um, especially um, I only have experience since 2003, um, uh -huh. but sales, we, we reached over almost 1.1 million this year, just wow. for the city market. Um, we also have Farmers in the Park that was started this uh, last year, and that is a Wednesday afternoon market uh, from 3 to 7 at Mead Park. And um, that actually did really well this year, too. It did better wow. than, the year, than its pilot year. Um, and so we were pretty excited about that. So, so the past year, it was the record-breaking year of all the years the, the market's been going on. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, this year, we broke a million. Um, and I guess, I think the, the most ever sales was 2002, I want to say. And that was like 413,000. Wow, so, so, so this year's more than double the more previous than double. record. And did you work with the, the Piedmont Environmental Council on the, the Buy Fresh, Buy Local yes. campaign? I have, and I and I continue to work with um, Piedmont Environmental on different on lots of different things. Um, so we're working on a, a conference for food processors now, and you know I work with the okay. extension. Well, tell office. me about the the food processors. We just did the whole kitchen inspection thing with yeah. uh, uh, with VDAX. Uh, VDAX and and uh, Alan. Oh, Alan, sure. yeah. Yeah, and he's actually lives right out near yeah. me, and, and we went through all kinds of things, and he came through and said, oh yeah, it's all beautiful. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> after you filled out piles and piles yeah, of Yeah, yeah. One of the things we're trying to do also with uh, VDAX and, uh, and Todd Haymore, the Commissioner of Agriculture, is to, to get them on camera talking to us and telling us about what's happening so that people can see that they're, they're really trying to help the growers. It kind of comes across when Alan comes there and says, you can't sell that or your scales are condemned. Or when, when those inspections happen, um, they get kind of a, a bad side and then everybody wants to fight them. Yeah. And, and there really is, their charter really comes from, let's help the people not make mistakes right. so they don't have errors, and then we'll stand behind them. So mm -hmm. if they come and inspect your kitchen and then somebody says they got sick from your food, they're on your side right. saying, we checked they did what they needed to mm -hmm. do. Uh, so they're really you know, trying to help you with some of that liability. So we're trying to get a, a good story to show that that they're not, because you know, Alan said, I hate coming inspecting the markets because everybody thinks I'm this bad guy shutting right. them down. And all we're really trying to do is just get these, and, and, and the requirements aren't that difficult. No, they're not. Uh, and if you, and, and, you, and they really are best management practices, which every farmer, you know, wants to do anyway for, mm -hmm. for saving money. So, um, how, if, if you could tell me a little bit about, because I know you get caught in the middle of that sometimes, where vendors are like, why are they doing this? And and, uh, yeah. and we have a segment with Christine talking about her, her the law that they got through and the, mm -hmm. the not for resale labels. And, right, and which so you, I tell found us very confusing this year. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I understand, um, I, th I thought I understood her the thing that they got passed and uh, I ended up that I didn't really, um, uh, so. What was the confusion? Well, we found out when Alan came to the market, this sticker only applies to certain things and, you know, like baked goods, uh -huh. non-hazardous foods, right? not hot pepper jelly, right. not um, things with eggs in it, not, you know, so, which is kind of confusing because cake has eggs in it. Right. But it's not a hazardous food. <laughs> That's right. right. But a custard is. Right. Ice, cr ice cream's hazardous, but not cake. Yeah. Okay, so um, it's just kind of confusing, yeah. and so that's one of the things that uh, I'm working with PEC and the Extension Office to try to to create a like a conference. It's still in the we're just planning it now, and um, we're more or less trying to you know 
get a meeting time that everyone can come. So is this a conference to, to get the vendors and, and, and yeah. the officials together just to talk about what it is? Yeah. We're trying to break down the intimidation factor because it is intimidating. Uh -huh. um, you know, because we, we have, you know, at the market we have some little old ladies that have, right. have been baking cornbread muffins and cookies for, you know, 30 yeah. years. Yeah. Well, they don't want anyone at the, in their kitchen. Right. And, and I understand that and I respect that. And that's why the Christine Solemn John Coles thing was so wonderful for those little old ladies that right. are just baking non-hazardous things. So we had, they put a label on it that's not for retail. Not for resale. And that's totally fine. Right. There's something going on now where some vendors think the market ought to go to November instead of October or through November. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know you had sent out uh, an email about that, didn't get much response, yeah. and one of the vendors is kind of taking it on to, to search a little farther. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I mean, basically, um, there's a, there's a vendor who who brought the I idea up to me, and of course, I think it's a pretty good idea, um, as long as is we have produce uh -huh. into November. And it, I, I guess it really depends on the year what what you have available. Some people have it all year, um, so um, so we we basically are putting some feelers out there to find out who's interested, um, and. We're going to look into seeing if if it's possible. If it's possible, you know, to use the parking lot um, into November. How many vendors are there now? Over sixty. Oh yeah, there, we average about eighty-nine vendors a week. Eighty-nine every Saturday. Mm -hmm. And here at the Holiday Market. Here at the Holiday Market, it's probably more like thirty-five. Uh huh. But that's still a, a lot of participation when there are places like Waynesboro and Richmond and, and Harrisonburg. And Harrisonburg, yeah. New one. yeah. The city sees the value in, in the farmer's market and nothing's going to be done. You know, they're not gonna sell the lot uh -huh. unless there's a home for the city market. Okay. I mean, they see, they see the value and know that the market is so important okay. to Charlottesville and the residents. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much thank for you. taking this time in the snowy, cold uh, yeah. <laughs> December market. And we, we look forward to the new warm season. Yeah, me too. And uh, we'll cover some more stories. And uh, hopefully we can get uh, every vendor at the market, uh, get a story of every vendor at the market for Meet the Farmer TV. Oh, that'd be great. So next week, we'll explore the deeper values and hidden benefits of local food systems. We'll also look at how waste products can be recycled into chicken feed. For more information about Meet the Farmer TV, visit our website, meetthefarmer.com. Meet the Farmer TV has been made possible by the generous support of Planet Earth Diversified. Makia Video Productions and Frank Melly Productions With additional support from Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture.